So, does anybody know what this is a picture of? It is, it's fungi on a leaf surface magnified a bunch of times. I can't tell you which one, but I thought it was so cool. I would like to hang it in my living room. I just think it's really great. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about botanical crime scene investigation. I'm so sorry if um, you thought this was gonna be forensics and plants and dead bodies, because it's gonna be about plants. But there is a staff person at APD whose job it is to be a forensic entomologist, and I thought, Maybe at one of our other meetings in the future, it'd be fun to have him come and talk. But we're going to talk about how plants get injured and killed. But first, I want to say why this is so important and why the Watershed Protection Department exists. Oh, I like this. I can just feel it. Um, that, you know, we have this wonderful department that helps conserve our water. Our charge is to keep it clean. So keeping nasty pesticides and chemicals and Anything that can go down the storm drain or go down into the sinkholes, we want to keep out of our water supply. So does anybody know the definition of a watershed? I had the maps out in front. What's, what is it? Catchment basin. Catchment basin. Anybody else? Where it all drains. Well, it's the area of land that drains to a lake, a creek, or an aquifer. So it depends on which water body you're describing. So Austin has 66 different creeks. And you see those signs entering Shoal Creek Watershed. That's our department educating you about your local environment. Um, so it's an area of land that drains to a, a creek, lake, or watershed. So say that the property we're on, I'm not sure what watershed we're in. Does anybody know? Um, probably the Ladybird Lake watershed. Um, but if you were next to a creek, like Shoal Creek, you would be in the Shoal Creek watershed. So all the water that hits that land goes into Shoal Creek. Then many of them end up in Ladybird Lake. So it's also the Ladybird Lake watershed, this entire area. But because we're over the entire Edwards Aquifer. Oh my. Oh, sorry. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> Okay, let's try again. Um, so we're also in the Edwards Aquifer watershed. So it depends on which water body you're referring to. Now when you see those signs entering environmentally sensitive recharge zone, that's when you're directly over the aquifer. This is a compilation picture that shows, um, you know, like say that's a sinkhole like out at the Wildfire Center Cave and the water, there's no soil. Um, on the west side, we know how rocky it is to filter the water. So a lot of it runs off, goes down into those sinkholes, goes down into the aquifer in those caverns, and then a whole bunch of it ends up actually at Barton Springs. And when I first started, I was like, really? Oh, it all comes down to Barton Springs. And um, I don't think I gave, I'll have to get you the handouts later, that show the dye trace studies that some of our scientists did and they put non-toxic dye in those sinkholes out by Bowie and out by the Wildfire Center. So they put non-toxic dye in the sinkhole when the water was moving and they measured to see how long it took to go underground and then come up at Barton Springs. Guess how long from, say, the Wildfire Center? Two days. Two days, that's why it's so sensitive, is because everything we put on our landscape goes right down in there. So let's keep the nasty stuff off of the landscape and no oil and you know, let's be smart about it. So this shows, again, a compilation of a sinkhole going into the aquifer and then bubbling up at Barton Springs. And you can actually go down by the diving board and that's where the springs come out. So if you haven't been to Barton Springs, please go because it's, it's a very special place and we're lucky to have it and this is partly why we make such a big deal of it. There's also an endangered uh, salamander there that helps us protect that water quality because it, a salamander, it's not fuzzy like a koala bear, but um, it's very important because it's an indicator species like the canary in the coal mine of our water quality and if that salamander starts to decline, then that means our water quality is declining. So we wanna make sure we keep it clean. So why would you go and try, spend time trying to do, diagnose a plant problem? Well, first of all, it's all about integrated pest management and the whole Grow Green program is based on integrated pest management. And the shortest um, thing I can tell you that it means to me is common sense. It's like, let's figure out if there's a physical way we can deal with something or a barrier or something we can do before we even think about putting a pesticide down. And when I said I love pesticides, I do, but keep in mind there's a huge range of toxicities. Diatomaceous earth is a pesticide. 
it's pretty handy, little diatoms with sharp little edges that cut into those insects and dry them out. That's how it kills them. It's not going to hurt us. It's not going to hurt our water. So when you look at pesticides, you have, in, you know, a safer, I should say, a, a insecticidal soap all the way to chloridane and DDT and everything in between. So we're talking about using the least toxic things if you even have to use them. But we can be smarter than the bugs and we can be smarter than the weeds and we can understand their life cycles and when they're most vulnerable because um, that's the only way we're gonna you know, manage them. I don't say control them. So that's all part of uh, sustainable management practices. Of course, reducing all the chemical use, protecting our water. Saving time and money. I actually have a pesticide applicator license and I have a few little um, gardens that I take care of. And I can so much quicker weed this front yard than I can go buy some pesticide and drive over there and get it and mix it up and come back and put it all together and make sure the sprayer works and, you know, and then spray it. I could have had that yard weeded. And I know that's not practical on a large scale for some of you guys that do you know, large landscape maintenance. But uh, for some situations, I think if we just, you know, instead of going to the gym, pull some weeds. It's good therapy too. Um, and then provide a new service. I think there's a huge market for people to do this garden coaching, where you just walk through their landscape with them and help them figure out what they need to do. Uh, there's so many people, my phone is ringing off the hook. I can't, I just, um, everybody needs help. And so I'm hoping that you guys will, you know, have come out of this with some ideas of new services that you can provide. So again, integrated pest management, our next speaker, Wizzy Brown, is gonna talk all about IPM. So I'm just gonna say that this is all part of that process, is asking the right questions, you know, going through the process of elimination, understanding your local conditions and your weather history. For instance, the really cold winter we had the winter before, coupled with the drought we had, these trees are all stressed out that predisposes them to problems in the future. So you're likely to see a lot more borer problems and canker problems because just because they survived the drought doesn't mean it didn't weaken them. You know, they can't go jump in Barton Springs to cool off like we can. So, um, you know, they're still suffering. We need to take care of them. And that's kind of our basic city message is evaluate what you already have, take care of what you already have, and then think about renewing and planting some new stuff. So I would recommend that for your clients as well, is help them make sure that their trees are safe, that um, you know, their irrigation system's running properly, and that they've got every, the foundation set so they can you know, um, have fewer problems. Typical soil conditions, of course, that can be site specific. Um, and then being able to assess the site specifics for clues. So the first thing you have to do is identify the victim, which we're gonna say is the plant. Um, but also understanding just basics about how plants grow. Um, you know, you have the amazing chemical reaction photosynthesis that takes energy from the sun, hits those leaves, hits the chloroplast, and creates sugars that help develop the plant. That's amazing, really. Um, so the root system is very important, and actually this isn't the greatest graphic because you would think that that root system would be a little more established, but I think this is a pretty new uh, seedling that's just come up. So basically, those leaves are up there for photosynthesis, so if you have a plant that grows in the shade, it's going to have a bigger leaf surface area because it needs to catch more sunlight. But plants have also developed ways, there's different photosynthetic pathways, like we have warm season plants and cool season plants that the, hot, the warm season grasses actually process the uh, sunlight differently than some of the other plants. So just, I just wanted to remind you guys, because when you're looking at where these plants can get attacked, some things can attack them at that very, that apical bud, they can attack at the end of a branch, they can attack at the root, and that's all gonna give you clues to trying to figure out what's wrong. So here's the photosynthesis. There's a better root system. That looks just a little more proportional. Um, to supporting the foliage above, but there has to be a certain ratio of root system to support the foliage, um, and it's it usually it's you know, like a two or three to one ratio, maybe maybe two to one that there's um, at least um, well, I guess I shouldn't generalize that much, but you know there needs to be that root system has to support the foliage that's above it, so. Um, you have to take that in mind. And then also different tissue types. You know, we have herbaceous plants and they're much more succulent and this is their vascular bundle, bundles. That's like, um, 
you know, herbaceous stem that's juicy. It's, doesn't, it's not pithy, it doesn't have wood in it. So when we get cold temperatures, a herbaceous plant might freeze where a woody plant wouldn't, but some herbaceous plants have like antifreeze in their cells that keep them from freezing. So that's why some species will freeze back and some won't. That's just one factor. Um, so once you know the plant, then the first thing I ask, is there anything specifically about this plant? Because a lot of plants are notorious for having certain problems. Like crepe myrtles, a lot of them get powdery mildew. They just kind of go hand in hand. They've developed some varieties that are less, that are more resistant to powdery mildew. And then there are diseases like fire blight. It's actually a bacteria, and it looks like somebody took a torch on the tip of the plant, but it affects the entire prunus family. So apples, uh, pears, pyracanth, and photini, you'd probably be glad that uh, it got fire blight and killed it. But if that inoculant is in your property and you don't remove it, you're just making more spores that are gonna be able to move to other plants, your, your trees that you may have more of a preference for, like your apples and your pears. So a huge thing about um, IPM is monitoring in your landscapes at home and for your customers, take a little time just to walk through and look at things and look under the leaves and see what's going on, especially if you're there on a somewhat regular basis. If you only go to a site once a month, it's amazing what can change in a month. So still, an even better reason to walk through and kind of assess what's going on. So this is one of my favorite graphics I've ever seen, and I asked permission from Dr. Bowden at Virginia Tech, because it's a disease donut. Don't you love that name? But it really shows the big picture of all the different ways that plants can get attacked. So over here on the, on the left side, we have all of the non-living things, air pollutants, the pH of the soil, um, drought, those are all either environmental issues, you know, like it rained a lot or didn't rain enough, or they're cultural issues, which means how we take care of them. A plant can die from overwatering by getting too much rain, and it can over die from the cultural practice of overwatering with irrigation. It doesn't matter, it's still, so that whole left side is either it's an environmental effect that's affecting the plant, or it's a cultural. Most, most um, problems that I get questions about are, I would say 70, 75% of them have something to do with how it was planted, how it was taken care of, where it was planted, or some other environmental factor like drought. Most of the time that's it, so that's where you kind of want to start. And then we'll talk about um, just a few examples of all the living things. Just like us, plants can get infected with viruses and bacteria. Um, and fungal problems and, and all those living things. So um, I gave this as your handout. Um, I just think it's a really great reference if, and you don't have to follow along, but basically I'm kind of giving some sam examples of each one of these. Um, so if it's an environmental thing, the symptoms are fairly uniform. It's gonna you know, hail over the whole site, so it's gonna affect a lot of different plants. They generally show up quickly at one time because something happened to the environment around it that affected those plants. It doesn't appear to be spreading. If it's a living thing and it's a disease like the fire blight, it will spread to other things. But if it's an environmental or a cultural thing, it's probably not going to spread. And then may affect more than one plant at a time. Most diseases are very specific to a certain plant family, so like the, um, the uh, crepe myrtles get powdery mildew, but that's not the same powdery mildew that gets on roses. There are a few diseases that are more widespread, like cotton root rot that will, start, that will be less selective, but most of the diseases are specific. So, um, so, it's, so if it's environmental, it might affect more than plant, one plant type, but if it's an infectious thing, it's probably just gonna attack your salvias or it's just gonna attack your roses. So here's an example, like I was saying, that, um, that Sotol, that was actually from the, remember like how many summers ago when it rained the whole time? That died from, um, over, from too much rain. It wasn't too much water. And so that's one thing that Meredith said when you're planting these plants that like hot, rocky, dry situations, make sure that they have good drainage now because if, if and when we ever do get that kind of rain, they'll start to rot. And so that plant was dis predispositioned to be stressed out and then an infectious um, fungi probably attacks the roots and actually makes it rot and makes it slimy. But it was stressed out by the condition of getting too much water. Um, 
I don't know how much air pollutants show up in our, you know, in, in affecting our plants, but I'm sure there are some plants that are more sensitive than others. But another thing, oops, that can be um, another chemical is like sulfur is a pretty good um, fungicide, but you don't want to put it on your rose foliage when the temperatures are over 85. And that's, we're going to tell you over and over, read the label, read the label, read the label. It will tell you that on the label. You don't want, and by law, you have to follow the label. So, um, and also this is a way to protect your plants. And why put it on there if it's not going to do any good or if it's going to harm the plant? Um, herbicide damage happens when there's maybe drift. If it's windy and you put something with glyphosate out there and it drifts over to those plants over there and you'll get this really distorted, it kind of starts to grow itself to death because that's kind of how that herbicide works. Um, so you'll get this really weird distortion. So when you see that symptom, you'll go, oh, has anybody been spraying herbicide around here lately? Because maybe your neighbors were spraying something and just a little bit can, can actually damage some plants that are extra sensitive. And then the other one is you know, spraying herbicide and turf grass. And um, since we have the state turf grass specialist coming later, I'm not going to talk much about turf grass. Um, and then this is a big one, the soil pH acidity not happening. We're super alkaline soil, super alkaline water. It's alkaline, alkaline, alkaline. So if you have a native plant that grows out in the wild and does fine, and then you put it in a landscape, it's now a cultivated native plant. And if it gets a lot of water, and the nutrients get washed out, they start to get chlorotic like this. So even that's a dwarf yopon, um, it still gets that yellow color. And the best thing that you can do for that to give it a boost is to spray it with some kind of foliar, um, you know, like something that has micronutrients, has to grow fish, fish uh, seaweed or compost tea or something, because you want that plant to green up so those chloroplasts can be green so they can photosynthesize because as that plant fades, its, its ability to photosynthesize and support itself diminishes. And so eventually it will starve itself to death if it doesn't have any green chloroplasts. And then on the turf grass, you can see, well, you can't see it super good, but there's, it's called intervenal chlorosis. And you can see there's green veins, like if you can't see them, but you can look at it online, um, that that's a, an indication of iron deficiency, and there might be iron in that soil, but it's chemically bound to the soil particles and the plants can't get it. So you have to give it to them with green sand or organic matter or compost or something to help get those nutrients released. Um, drought, well, we all know what happens to plants in a drought. Um, first, their moisture level drops, then they start to curl up because they're losing water and they, they can't replace it fast enough because there isn't any. And then they, their margins start to turn brown, and then the veins turn brown, and then leaves fall off, and then the plant starts to die back. And over time, eventually, um, it can kill them. And we've seen that happen um, with a lot of, of trees around here. But we've also seen who can take the heat, haven't we? See who can make it through. Um, cold temperatures, of course. Um, um, this is a sago palm. Um, it froze back um, the winter before last, and you know we just if you just leave it like that until it starts to warm up, you can cut those fronds off. And, and all the ones that I know came back. Did anybody lose any sagos in the freeze the year before last? Oh, that's great to hear. They what? Came back. Yeah, they came back. Well, that's what I'm saying that we didn't. Nobody lost them. So yay for sagos. And then you get cold damage like this. Um, there's nothing you can do about that. You're going to have to live with that cosmetically. That was cold. It was cold that night. It did that damage. There's nothing you can do to fix it. So you have to, it's a cosmetic issue, and you just have to say, okay, I can live with that. Or if you want to be really mean, you can pull it out, put it on a compost pile, and plant another pretty nice, fresh new one there. But um, just know once those cells have been damaged and those water um, molecules in their cells have burst and made it mushy, then there's, there's no coming back. Um, mechanical impact, this is, you know, weed eaters, uh, mower damage, anything that's hitting up against that plant. Um, and I wanted to show this because I think it's important when, to understand how woody plants grow. Um, you know, we have the bark around the outside and then the hardwood on the inside, but the actual vascular system of woody plants is right underneath the bark. The, the cells that bring the water from the roots and go up to the leaves and bring the sugars back down are right underneath the bark. And that's why we do the scratch test. If you just do a teeny little scratch, if you can see green, there's hope. 
if it's all brown and that vascular system is all, um, if you can't find green, then chances are it's not gonna come back. Of course, all you have to do is wait a little bit because everything's leafing out now. But um, in the winter, people are like, how do I know if my tree died? It's like, well, wait. <laughs> but this was another way to test that. Um, it's just to do that little, um, <clears throat> that little scratch test. But that's important because if weed eaters are hitting that and cutting that bark, that means they're choking off that whole section of the tree. And some trees will just grow right over it and some trees won't. Um, so I put this back up there again, just as the contrast. So, so herbaceous plants, you know, they don't have a defined system like woody plants do. Theirs is just all mixed up in the stem. So see this tree, so we'll too bad for you, I'm just gonna grow right over you. But you know, there's no reason why whoever did that shouldn't, why didn't they remove those? It's like, that was just, so the tree said, I'll show you, I'll just grow over you. <laughs> but not all of them do that. Um, and then there's this, you know, it's like if you have that bark, they have that uh, mulch up against the base of the tree like that, if it's thin bark, eventually it can rot it and then expose the vascular system and then again choke off the root system. So this is so important for the maintenance guys to understand. Um, if you don't see a flare at the base, you, should see, you shouldn't see a tree up and down. It should have a flare at the bottom. That means the grade was changed and um, pull it away from the base until you see the flare. Um, a lot of times as maintenance people, you inherit some of these problems. So if you're going on a site to do the maintenance for the first time, I would do a thorough site analysis of what's already there. It's kind of like doing a walkthrough when you rent an apartment. You wanna make sure that you know everything that was there <clears throat> before you started, and then you can be the one that comes and helps them fix it. <laughs> if the trees could talk to us, I, I, that's my superpower I would like to have. If anybody knows somebody who can grant superpowers, I'd like to be able to talk to plants. But they do talk to us, um, and they give us clues. Um, does anybody want to guess on what was going on here? No. Well, the reason why I know what was happening there is because the person who installed this turf told me um, they put in a lot of turf on this site, and that was, they put this turf down first, and this was from walking over it. Those guys walked over it a bunch of times, you know, putting in the turf in the backyard. I, I would have said, oh, is it a disease? Is it brown patch? And you start to look at it and, and start to look at the closer and find, you can't find any fungal spores. And then you talk to the contractor who says, oh, yeah, that was our, my guys in their wheelbarrows going over that 1,500 times. Um, here's again the mulch issue. This is the base of a mountain laurel. If you have mountain laurels like this, pull that mulch away. It's the same problem. You should be able to see those multi-trunk plants. You should be able to see where all those uh, branches come out of the ground. They shouldn't be covered up like the picture before. So if nothing else, pull it away from the base before it rots that bark and kills that, that mountain laurel. Another thing is with mountain laurels, is that you know they're indigenous to Central Texas in like Mount Bunnell on rocky limestone cliffs. So if you plant them in an urban landscape that has a lot of clay or has bad drainage, they, they can get a disease called diplodia. It's a vascular disease and entire branches will start dying. So make sure you have good drainage um, if you're gonna use those in landscapes. Um, too much light or not enough light. Um, this, there was an oak tree here and it got cut down and so this aspidistra started to how much time do I have? I do, but uh, I, okay, all right, woo. Okay, um, so not enough or too much light. Like I said, this, this uh, aspidistra was fine, and then they cut down an oak tree, and then it started to get burned edges on it. Um, again, mulching, mulching, mulching. It's a pet peeve of mine. Um, here we have these beautiful red yuccas, and again, if that Mulch, mulch stays up against the base of that plant and it stays wet enough, eventually it will start to rot it and you'll just be able to pull leaves out from it. So all you have to do is just pull it back a few inches so it's not right up against the base of the plant. Um, and again, if plants get too much water or not enough water, that starts to predispose them to diseases. So some plants can only take 18 hours of standing water. So when you're thinking about your rain gardens, <clears throat> there are some plants that can take more like 
Bushy blue so we, 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 again we want a lot out of our plants we really want the plants that do well in the bar ditch for our rain gardens because you want them to be able to be dry a huge amount of the time and then be able to be saturated for a while and then come out of it so I think we're still experimenting but there are lots of rain gardens going in and I hope that you'll share your successes with us and let us know what's not working so we can make sure that we share it with everybody else um, so some plants, if they're standing in water for as little as 18 hours, they can, they can start to, their roots can start to rough, s suffer. Um, and then they're, most, they're more likely to get the root rot. Of course, not enough water, we all know what happens there. Um, well, and also that they are more susceptible. Like I said, the trees will probably have more canker problems this year. Um, and so I would definitely be checking out the health of your trees and your clients' trees. So now we're gonna talk about things that are living that like to infect plants. Um, oftentimes the symptoms are scattered, you know, because every organism, what's their goal in life? I mean, most of them is to reproduce. So if it's an annual plant, they make lots of seeds. If it's um, a fungus, they make lots of spores um, and they've figured out different ways to to make sure that their species continues. So if they're attacking a plant, um, you know, it, it might end up being scattered um, because of the way that the, the pathogen uh, disperses itself. And it's usually on one species again, but it could be on more than one plant in, in the grouping. So if you get, um, you know, caterpillars um, affecting, say, I, I saw these little caterpillars on rosemary a couple years ago, and you have three of them next to each other, I mean, you start to look at it, if you catch it early on the first one, you don't, you know, you can get it under control, but if it infects the first one and then starts moving to the next one and the next one, then you have a more severe situation. So again, monitoring and just paying attention to what's going on um, is a good way to get on top of these things before they get to the point where you'd even consider using any kind of pesticide. And there's usually some kind of clues. I mean, if there's been an insect chewing, you see the chew marks and then you see uh, the honeydew that the aphids leave on your cars. Um, the, you know, the aphids have uh, piercing mouth parts and they suck sap out of the leaves and then they exude honeydew and it lands on your cars and then uh, this mold grows on it and it makes a big mess. Um, so that's a clue. <laughs> you, you see the caterpillars up in the trees. But for any of these things to attack something, there has to be three things there present all at the same time. The pathogen has to be present, whether it's the spores or the seeds or the bacterial infection. Uh, there has to be the host uh, that is susceptible to that problem. And then there has to be a suitable environment and um, this happened, I got, we're in the spills response department and one of the uh, receptionists called me last, well, it was that year, it was so wet, and said, Denise, somebody has called in and they've got ectoplasm on their front yard and they want you to come and look at it. And I, I said, ectoplasm, the Ghostbusters, that's who it is. And I said, um, well, isn't that a spills response thing? And she said, well, it's in the lawn, so you have to go. And I said, okay. And I got there and you know what it was? It was green slime mold, and it looked like a thin layer of green jello. And it was, you know, it was a, uh, it was someone's lawn that had horse herb and a little St. Augustine. It was a mixture of everything, and there was a bare patch. And those spores had probably been sitting there for who knows how long. And the conditions were right, and it got wet enough, and it made this beautiful green lime, slime mold. So I'm like, oh my gosh, it's slime mold. And she's looking at me like, lady, you're nuts. And she goes, well, you're not gonna touch it, are you? And I said, well, I'm gonna rake, because you could just rake it up. It was just a really a thin layer. I said, well, I'm, I'm gonna touch it, but I'm not gonna eat it. <laughs> so, <laughs> she just thought, okay, but she knew what it was. But my point is, that pathogen had been there a long, long time, and the host plant had been there a long, long time, but the environment was not such that uh, it could, express itself, and so that was pretty cool. I wish I would have taken a picture. So with the hose plants, um, you know, like when you see a crepe myrtle that's been bred to be resistant to, to powdery mildew, well, that they specifically chose that. They may have chose other qualities, but it's just for that disease. So like on tomato plants, that they have a number of different things on the label that they're resistant to. It's just the ones, the, the, the diseases that are on the label. Um, 
some plants have to be in a certain stage of growth. Like when you plant little seedlings and they rot right at the soil line, that's called damping off. That's actually a fungus that does that. So that, that damping off only happens on seedlings because that's where it attacks. Um, and then I mentioned the plants labeled as disease resistant or just resistant to that disease. Um, and then pathogens, um, again, they're host specific, maybe to a genus or a family. So the black spot on the roses isn't gonna affect sages or turf grass. The powdery mildew that's on the roses is not the same one that's on the pavonia. Um, and the fire blight that, um, you know, we talked about it's on the prunus species. So it can, what's going on? What is that? <laughs> oh, we can take a break. <laughs> See what's going on. City halls never know. There's always something going on here. Um, okay, again, the suitable environment, whether it's the amount of moisture, the temperature, the sunlight, the wind. Um, do you guys remember last fall, all the viguaris, the nobula, all that, um, a skeleton eye that just came up everywhere and it was all along the roadsides and it was the yellow flowers and it gets kind of tall. Those seeds had been there a long time just waiting for the right conditions. So we're not under attack, are we? <laughs> like what's going on? Okay, so, um, so again, th when the uh, conditions are right, then the, uh, the infections can, um, Rust? Yeah, rust is a, is a fungal pathogen that um, by moisture. Now, so, there are some, like powdery mildew doesn't need moisture, even though it's a fungus. So, you know, we as humans like to put plants and animals in little categories, but they don't always fit. So I never say, oh, it always does that, because as soon as you say that, you'll find a plant that doesn't do that. Um, but as far as rust goes, it is a fungal pathogen, and most likely it needs some kind of water on the surface of the leaves to spread. So that's why we say water your plants down at the base, because if that foliage is staying wet, then it's creating the right environment for the rust. So you're better off putting the water on the ground and not this pop-up spray heads that get the foliage wet, or aim it away from that. So viruses um, or viroids, um, I guess now we have some viral medications that we can take, but as far as I know, there aren't any for viruses on plants. Um, this is a picture that shows a leaf surface and that uh, hexagonal thing over in the corner, that's a little fi virus um, viroid. I don't know if that's the right term. Maybe Wizzy will tell us if I was wrong. But it lands on the leaf. It has to have a way to get into the leaf. So there has to be some kind of hole in the leaf. And then it lands on the leaf. It invades the DNA of the plant and takes over and starts spreading. Um, and says, OK, you're mine now, and I'm going to spread. So if you find a plant that has a virus, you just need to get rid of it. Like dig it up, pull it up, take it out, put it in your dumpster. Don't take it anywhere else. Um, you know, don't compost it because you don't want that virus sticking around. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, and it's hard sometimes. You're like, oh, I don't want to kill this plant, but you don't want it to spread because a lot of viruses are spread by insects where they'll have a piercing mouth part and they'll get the virus on their mouth part and then they'll fly to another plant and infect it. And that's actually one way the oak wilt gets uh, transmitted, not in the leaf, but when you cut the bark open. So with viruses, let me go back to that and show you, oops, uh-oh, I was doing so good. The one that had the virus picture. Yeah, that's not the best picture, but you can kind of see it's kind of funky and it's kind of weird and it's not really defined. And a lot of times, like you'll see, um, uh, what was it, like a daylily that had all the stems merged together and was kind of flat. Have you guys ever seen that? that? That's probably a virus. So those are the plants that you want to take out. Oops, going too fast. Okay, so um, this one, and you know, I'm sorry if somebody's here selling oleander, but the oleanders um, are, are getting infected with this leaf scorch, and that little sharpshooter is the vector that's moving it around. And once your plants, once your oleanders get infected with that, I don't know of any way that you can get rid of it. And I'm really glad that Wizzy is here because maybe she can tell us of something that I'm not aware of. 
because again, none of us know everything. But another thing about diagnosing plant problems is hopefully through this process, you've found out some people that you can ask and you can get some help because there's a lot to know. Whoever knew it was all this complicated. Um, so anyway, oleanders, you see them. Some of them do have cold damage, but when they start to die like that, and this is a really good one, you can see progressions. If you start when you're driving around, you say, oh, there's some oleanders. Oh, look, there's a dead one. Oh, the one next to it's dead. Oh, look, you can see the third one's getting it um, because it's, it spreads close by. So, and also oleanders really, really poisonous. Now they're, so I'm just saying I would be hesitant to plant any. And if I had them on a, a landscape that I was taking care of, I would be watching them closely to, because I think if you got it early, if you started to see the symptoms early, maybe you could get it. But be, once it gets infected, it's gonna get harder and harder. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Her question is, do plants get more susceptible to problems when you move them away from their native environment? And I would say in many cases, yes, because they, um, you know, that's not their native environment. But there are some of them that would do just fine. I mean, I think that we have native and adapted plants that have come from somewhere else. So it really depends on the plant. It depends on their specific requirements. If it's a plant that has a similar climate somewhere in the world, maybe it'll be okay here, but it's, and it may not have the pathogens that help keep it under control, and that's an issue with a lot of people. There's nothing, you know, their enemies aren't here to keep it in balance. So I, I just think it has to be kind of a case-by-case -case basis um, would be my educated guess on that. Um, this is just showing the beginning of fire blight in this pyracantha. So when you see that, you can see there's the one up in the right-hand corner, and then there's a little patch of it starting in that lower left quadrant. You can't really see it from there. But you need to prune that out right away and prune it down, you know, maybe two or three inches beyond where it's infected because you want to get that inoculant off of that property so it doesn't start to spread and go to other plants. Um, and this is a pretty cool picture. That's a mushroom. Those are all the fungal spores that are coming off of that. Of course, we don't see that microscopic world, but it's definitely going on there. And the way a lot of mushrooms come up so quickly overnight is they're like little balloons and they fill up with water and their cells just expand. And so that's why those, like, oh, that wasn't there yesterday. How did they do that? They figured out all these cool ways to adapt. Um, and, and so that's one way that mushrooms, this is, mushrooms don't have flowers, but they, they reproduce by spores, and so a lot of these will need some water to get into to be spread to other places. Or they'll fall on the ground, and then when you water the plant, it splashes up. So that's another good reason to put mulch down there um, to, you know, help keep the, um, the ground covered so those spores are, are less likely to come in contact with the plant. Um, and here is um, mistletoe, parasitic plant, um, you know, this is a, a parasite is one that will um, suck energy out of the plant that it's um, growing on. Mistletoe is very common. Actually, I thought I had taken the, the ethylene, um, the chloral off of here. I'm sorry, I didn't do that. I don't know if that's still labeled for it. Um, when Chris Dolan, the city um, urban forester, was talking to us last week at the Wildfire Center, he said that, you know, basically they don't really recommend doing anything. I mean, you can try to cut it out. It's just going to grow back. Um, but it'll take a long time to kill a tree. But he said any deciduous tree that you see right now that has green globs in it, that's mistletoe. So I don't think it would hurt to clip it out, but you have to be practical if it's way up in the tree, are you gonna be able to get to it? So it's really kind of knowing it's there and, and knowing there's really not a whole lot you can do about it. But those berries, the birds eat the berries and then they fly around and then they disperse them <laughs> and they, land in the tree crotches, and that's a lot of times where you see the, um, the mistletoe. And you guys probably know this, but mistletoe fruit is very poisonous to people. Not to birds, but it is to people. Okay, and then nematodes. Um, I think Wizzy has some pictures of nematodes. They're really gross little microscopic worms that are just, ugh. 
um, and they get, in, they get into the root systems of the plants and cause all kinds of problems. But it makes sense that they're more common in sandy soil because they need to move through the soil, and sandy soil is looser and easier for them to grow through. Um, and so you'll start to see the top of the plant affected because the nematodes are attacking the roots. So once the roots can't take up any more water, guess what? The plants start to wilt, they get stunted, um, they'll, get, they'll infect the roots and get these knobs and galls all over them. So, um, and, then, and then there are the beneficial nematodes that John Dromgold talked about that you can put in the soil to help with fire ants and grubs and um, what's the other one? Fire ants, grubs, and fleas. Um, but you have to do it at the right time and, and know that you're gonna have to water the ground and make it loose enough for the nematodes to get in. But again, understanding the system is the way that you uh, attack the enemy. Yes, uh, the question is, are there different kinds of nematodes? Are there beneficial ones and uh, bad ones? Yes. You know, it's, I think it's like everything else. There's good pathogen, there's good fungi and there's bad fungi. There's good bacteria and there's bad bacteria. So bad, good, you know. Um, our friend Pat McNeil, um, one time I was pruning a plant. He said, why are you pruning that plant, Denise? And I said, because it's good for the plant. He goes, really? Is it good for the plant or is it good for you? <laughs> I was like, oh, it's, what we do to the plants is good for us. They're doing their thing and adapting and if they wanna have branches get sick and break off, you know, we're the ones that say, oh, we want you to look nice or we, you know, so it's kind of funny. Um, we expect a lot from our plants. Um, okay, so then insects. Um, there's a number of different kinds of insects. Um, the adults that um, are, they suck juice out of the plants. So um, we have aphids as the first one, so they like that new growth. The cells of the plants aren't really hardened off yet, so they can get that needle into that uh, new growth and suck the juice out of it. Um, the middle one is spider mites, and that's webbing. This is a pretty badly infested, um, it's a ureops um, on a patio and it's just covered with spider mite webs. Um, when it's first infected, they're harder to see, but if you see any little bit of webbing, um, be on the lookout for that. They really like it when it's hot out, and that's another thing, understand the life cycles. Um, spider mites love it when it's hot, chinch bugs love it when it's hot, um, and so if I came across this, one of my first things would be, well, is the plant susceptible to that? But it's once you see it, you pretty much know that that's, um, that's gonna be spider mites. And then the other one is more skeletonized. Um, actually, I'm not sure, Wizzy, do you know what that right one is? I'm embarrassed, it's like skeletonized, but it's, it, maybe it's not a sucking insect issue. It's more like a rasping. I'm sorry, I put her on a spot. Let's just skip it. <laughs> um, and then we have insects that um, are rasping and they kind of um, scrape the, plant cells and then get the juice that way. Um, these are thrips. Thrips are a pain, because thrips get inside the, the rosebud before it even opens, and they're in there eating the cells, and then when your, your rose opens, it's got brown edges around it. You're like, well, what happened? Did somebody spray herbicide? Did I put too much fertilizer on there? What happened? And then you find out it's, it's thrips, and you go, oh because those little rosebuds are full of those little thrips. Guess what you have to do? You have to cut your roses off because you don't want those thrips getting everywhere. They're hard to get rid of. Um, so then you have to just deal with trying and managing them. Did you have a question? Yeah. Wow. Okay, he's asking a question where they planted a whole bunch of rosemary um, along a driveway, and a week later they had spider mites all over them. Um, and he's asking what to do about spider mites. And, and Wizzy's definitely going to talk about some of the products, but 
Um, you can use um, the sun's, like horticultural oils, the lightweight oils that you can use in the summertime. It just smothers them. I mean, the first thing you can do, actually, if you're IPM, if you can, you can spray them off with a hose, but you have to keep doing that. So if it's your own landscape, that might be practical. If it's a job site you're going to once a week, you can start with that to try to, because you're not physically knocking them off, just you know, and see if that works. But if that doesn't work, then you know you can try something like the insecticidal soap, which will actually um, smother them, and the light horticultural oil sprays will sm physically smother them. So those are the two things that I would start with. Because, um, you know, I said I like to kill stuff. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't really like to kill stuff, but I don't like spider mites, and I'm okay with spraying something on them to smother them. It's not a, a nasty pesticide. What? Um, spinosad also works on spider mites. Um, so you have three options, and maybe not a bad idea to rotate those. And I did also want to say, um, I learned this um, from our friend at the Texas Department of Agriculture that if you are spraying pesticides, even if you're using the least toxic ones and you're charging somebody for it, you have to have a pesticide applicator license. Um, I've had a number of arguments with people. Well, if I can buy it at the natural gardener, then it doesn't count. Yes, it does. If you are, if it's a service that you're providing to the public and you are charging them to spray their spider mites with insecticidal soap, you, by law, have to have a pesticide applicator license. So um, it's, it's a good idea to have one. I hardly ever use it, but if I need to, I have it, and it's, it's a good thing to have. So I just I wanted to mention that today. I don't know, are, John, are you here? John Max Schmidt was going to come today, maybe. Nope. OK, how much time do I have? 20 minutes. OK, I'm going to be done early. Oh, we have a question in the back. Yes, yes. He said, do you foresee any chemical-free Austin? Yes, I, I hope. I mean, that should be our goal. Whether it's practical that we'll ever get there completely, I don't know. But I think that we should be able to figure out ways to deal with these problems without having to use pesticides. And I would hope that wouldn't put you out of business, because then you could plant more plants. You know, spend your money on plants, not on pesticides. Um, you know, I just did, um, there's a new pesticide discharge permit that EPA is requiring the city to, to follow. Um, and it has to do with any uh, pesticide coming out of a sprayer that's within the bed and banks of all, all those creeks. So we did an analysis with actually the two mile floodplain. So if you look at all the creeks and then go out past the banks to where the two mile floodplain would be, uh, we did an analysis of all the city departments using pesticides. Um, and I can tell you there's not very much, and I wish I had the exact number, but if you look at all the property that the city owns, there is just a tiny fraction of our property that is even getting pesticides put on it. And that was kind of part of the resolution that Daryl Slusher started 10 years ago, is let's quit using pesticides and let's take care of our water. So I think, and the city walking the talk. And you know, we're not perfect here, you guys, but I hope that you've seen from all the speakers that we've had over the last six weeks that you know, we are working together more so than ever. It's very exciting. We just had a Grow Green meeting with people from all the different departments that do outreach and we're combining our efforts and being at Boost together and having a speakers bureau and putting on talks and doing things like this um, because we really are passionate about taking care of Austin, supporting businesses, having us all come together and have these conversations because maybe Maybe Manuel has learned something out in the field that none of us know about yet. But yes, my goal would be for all of us to spend our money on plants and, and cool pottery and wind chimes and whatever, the, you know, tools besides using pesticides. But when it's needed and you're using the right thing and it's timed right and you're just using a small amount to deal with that problem, that's integrated pest management. That's common sense. Yes. Yeah. Especially, I would work with cultural practices instead of just offering stuff to your organization. What was the situation with your organization? You know, that, that's key on, like, 
Yes, yes, and that again is, is assessing the site. So let me, I have 20 more minutes. Um, so insects chewing, um, the one on the left is leaf miners and you have the top surface of the leaf and the bottom surface of the leaf and they chew their way through like Pac-Man. And that's how they make those, those trails in there. And so that's an insect eating its way through the middle of that leaf. Um, and then the canna, the leaf roller, of course, that was all rolled up when that insect came through. So once you see that damage, you'll go, oh, I know what that is, that's leaf rollers. Because um, the leaf was rolled up and it, then it did that pretty little pattern. Of course, other herbivores, I'm not gonna go into all the specifics about deer um, because that's a whole nother talk, but they are, you know, they do attack our plants. Um, so then, I, as I was saying, you, you have resources. The first one, um, after you look at, if you find a problem that you don't know what the problem is, you can, um, on the diagnosis fact sheet that I had put in your packets and I brought some extra ones, you can contact the wonderful master gardeners at the Travis County Extension Office and they, there's, who's master gardeners here? See, they're wonderful. They're coming and learning all about this too and, and they're, um, I don't know if the, the woman's still out at the, um, at the desk, but they have been through lots of training to help you figure out what's wrong with your plants. Um, you can always call me. Um, if it's this time of year, I'll try to call you back as soon as I can. Um, also, you know what? If you use a lot of native plants, you won't have very many problems. Like Andrea said at the Wildfire Center, they don't have a lot of problems. Another thing is diversity. When you start to plant a lot of plants like that rosemary, it becomes sort of a monoculture, and if something attacks it, it's gonna move through. So if you had some, and I'm not saying that you should never do that, but you have some rosemary and then maybe something else and break it up. One thing that happens with salvia gregii is that it does have a lifespan, like five or six years, and I saw somebody plant tons of it everywhere, and each year it would get a little more woody, and then they had to take it all out. So diversity is a good thing. Plant a bunch of different stuff and, and maybe plant masses of something, but plant lots of different things because then you'll have fewer problems too. And I know that's not gonna help with what you have, but just things to keep in mind. Yes, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, he said he's, he loves to find aphids because he knows there's ladybugs and I hope you guys were here to see, uh, hear John Domgold's talk because that's the other thing about insects when they have different life cycles, sometimes they're in an eating stage and sometimes they're not. Um, like the butterflies, you know, they have siphoning mouth parts and they're drinking nectar, but when they're a caterpillar, they're munching. So it depends on their life cycle. So if you can't figure it out with our help and the Master Gardener's help and talking to your nursery folks, because I can tell you, if you're having that problem, there's a bunch of other people that are too. So you can almost guess that if you go to one of our great grocery nurseries, they'll say, oh yeah, that's spider mites and everybody's getting it and here's what you can do to help. Um, but then if you, and that's all free, if you call us, if you call the extension office, um, but if it gets to the point where it's a serious situation and it's a customer who's, you know, I really wanna know what's wrong with this, um, you can fill out this plant diagnosis form and, and pay to have, and send it to A&M and, and pay to have it tested for you. And so the, the form will have a lot of different things like I have, I have uh, mentioned. They want to get as much information about that site as they can to help figure out what's wrong. So they're gonna ask you, is it one plant? Is it a series of plants? Is it just on one species? Is it all the things that we've talked about? Um, I put this in here because um, I get a lot of phone calls and this citizen called me and I hadn't seen the picture yet and he said, well, I have a tree that still has some green on it. I wanna know if it's still alive. And I said, well, what kind of tree is it? And when was it planted? And you know, um, it just, he goes, I said, so does it have more than half of its green left? He goes, oh yeah. I said, could you send me a picture of it? And he sent me that picture and I was kind of sad because I was like, well, yes, it has some green on it, but I can't tell you that I think it's gonna make it because so much of it was already gone. It was, well, it still has some green on it and it wouldn't hurt to leave it, but chances are that tree's not gonna do very well. And sometimes people don't wanna hear the truth. <laughs> um, so I present it delicately like, well, from what I can see, the chances are it's probably, and then to see the cracked bark, um, it's probably not going to make it, but it won't hurt to let it see if it leaves back out. But I was, he could do the scratch test on those other branches. And 
I mean, he could have some kind of weird bonsai tree if he cut it right there at the, um, right above the green, but you know, or, or the Lorax might like it or something, I don't know. So things to remember, most of the plant problems are from environmental conditions or how it was taken care of. They can be attacked by all these different pathogens. Um, susceptibility to a problem can vary within a species. You can have three mountain laurels side by side. One can get infected and the others don't because they're genetically different. For plants that are propagated vegetatively where they take a cutting and so every one of those cuttings is identical genetically. You now, for path, like, like say um, a cornfield, it's all the same. A pathogen gets in there, it's gonna spread way quicker than if you have a natural system where the plants have come up from seed and, oh, thank you, <laughs> um, and have different genetics. Um, and then severity. I mean, this is a, a gall on an oak tree that's kind of cosmetic versus one that's been killed by oak wilt. So, you know, if your tree has a cosmetic problem, then it's, you know, I would just let it go. But if it's an oak wilt situation, then um, that's pretty extreme. That was meant to be an extreme picture. But you know, we were talking about the vascular system of the trees. Oak wilt infects those tubes that go from, that carry the water from the roots up to the leaves and they plug it up. And that's why it's such a nasty disease is because it's like us having a systemic disease versus having a mosquito bite. And that's kind of a good comparison here. The gall is the mosquito bite and the um, oak wilt is like cancer of the blood or something. So it's pretty serious. And that's me in the springtime. <laughs> That's me the last six weeks of training. Um, so actually, that is the end of my talk. Do you guys have any more questions? Oh, there's one right here. If we had to buy one gopher for the summer, summer of horticulture and practice, and would, would you suggest it? Oh. She asked if there was one book that I could suggest for all these different horticulture practices. Hmm. Well. Of course, I have to put in a plug for Grow Green because we have a lot of great information. It's not in a booklet. And then there's a wonderful master gardener guide um, that has all the basics about you know, what to do here in Austin. Uh, for native plants, the Wazowskis, the, you know, that book, Native Texas Plants, has been a Bible for all of us for many years. It's still a great book. Um, you guys saw the incredible resource the Wildfire Center has online for native plants, so, um, and I'll probably think of others, but. Well, I'm talking more about the, the Oh, the insects, oh, oh. Yeah, you know, I'd have to think about that. Uh, maybe, maybe Wizzy will be able to answer that, a specific book. There's good bugs, bad bugs. Um, gosh, I, I'm just not thinking of one right off the, the top. Master Gardener Guide, can anyone get that? Yeah, you can buy it at local nurseries. Okay. At local nurseries, at your Grow Green Nurseries. And the Wildflower Center and the gift shop. Thank you. Yeah, the Garden Festival, March 31st. Are you talking about that spiral? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I'm not talking about that. No, I was, I was answering your question incorrectly, but I, I honestly, I can't say right off the top of my head which book. You had a question? No? Anybody else? Oh, Morgan. I'm just curious, I've heard something related to mechanical damage, different <laughs> opinions on this golf pretty pounding the tree pretty heavily. Oh. Really Long-term impacts, you think, you know, what types of trees are more resilient? It depends on what angle you're coming from, but you mentioned the mechanical damage. Right. Well, that's a question I've never had before. Is a can frisbee golf hurt the trees? <laughs> you know, and I, I guess over time, if it hit it enough times, now oak trees have pretty thick bark, so it's not quite the same as a weed whacker. If you started putting blades on them, there'd be a problem. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know. Maybe we need to put some protection on them. Maybe we could make it more interesting and put something they would bounce off of and make it more of a challenge or something. But I'm not trying, I, I just really don't know. But I would think over time, if one frisbee kept hitting it enough times, that is it going to break through the bark? That's the question. 
Oh yeah, the women that knit stuff, we could have them knit socks for all the oak trees. I bet you they'd love to do that. Well, aesthetically, if it looks. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of been addressed, but yeah. in other areas, should that be integrated into the design? Yes. Of the golf course? Yes, if it's hitting the trees and breaking the bark and, and, and causing the. the Are they looking into that because of the big golf course and the hill club one? Uh huh. Yes. Yes, yeah, so she's saying that yes, over time, that that's, that's happening to the trees and we do need to take that into consideration and barks like post, or trees like post oaks that have thinner bark are gonna be way more susceptible. Okay, he's saying that he's an avid golf disc golf person. He's played on a lot of the different courses and that Peace Park in particular has a lot more trees that are close to each other. And so they're getting hit more often than some of the other ones that are more spread out. Is that, is that what I took? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, one of oh way over there. Yes. Uh-huh. Right. Um, so she's asking, um, are, are we promoting more of that? Right. Right, yes. And that's, that is part of IPM is you keep the plants healthy. It's just like us. If we're healthy and we're getting all the nutrition we need, we're a lot less susceptible to problems. If the plants are getting the nutrition they need, if they're healthy, if they're being watered properly, then they're going to be much more resistant to problems. So however we can help enhance that. And you look at the big circle, it's like, well, the, the nutrients have to be in the soil to be released to the roots that goes into the plants. We eat the plants and we get the nutrition and, and the plants get recycled and all that stuff gets recycled. It's kind of like the best analogy I can think of is that if you're somebody who eats fast food all the time versus if you eat a good, healthy, organic diet. If your plants are just getting synthetic fertilizers and even at small doses regularly, they're not the healthy system and we, we know now and pay more attention to what's going on below the ground because it is so much about the soil. And, um, and so much about the soil too when it comes to turf grass. So we're gonna hear about that soon. So okay, well thank you all so much.